Okay, um, let's get started. Uh, it's a pleasure to have everyone here this morning. My name is Holly Hutchison. I am from the Pacific Northwest CSA Coalition, and I'm also a member of the CSA Innovation Network, and we are happy to bring you this presentation on changes in CSA consumer preferences. Just a little bit of a welcome as we get started. Um, please remain on mute. Uh, for the entire session. That'll help us get through our speaker slides. And uh, if you would like to engage, we encourage you to use the chat function in the Zoom room. Uh, there is live closed captioning available, and uh, we will be recording the session and sharing it uh, in an email after the session is complete. So today, uh, first, we will introduce the CSA Innovation Network and talk briefly about who we are and what we do. Uh, and then I'm happy to present uh, Dr. Ryan Galt from UC Davis, who is our, our speaker for today. Uh, we'll leave some time at the end for a facilitated uh, discussion and Q&A, and then a brief wrap up. So the CSA Innovation Network uh, is a resource base of programs and tools built by and for the individuals and organizations throughout the country supporting CSA development. We strive to generate and facilitate idea sharing across the CSA community, which will build awareness of the value of CSA consumers. Just a brief overview of who we are. There are organizations all throughout the country who are participating in the Innovation Network and who bring you these materials. From, uh, from the Pacific Northwest and Seattle and California, all the way to New York and um, some of the NOFA organizations out there and Kentucky, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, a lot of groups are participating in this work. And we're very happy to, to be part of this and to have you here. Uh, there are several resources on our, um, on our website that you might be interested in. We encourage you to go take a look. Uh, one of them is, um, uh, th these are all located on the CSA Innovation Network website. Uh, and we do review and refresh these materials uh, periodically. So please keep in touch with the website, look for renewed campaign launch throughout the social media. And you can also get on our email list. Um, some of the materials we have are specific to um, renewal campaigns when you're trying to get new members to sign up to your, uh, when you're trying to get members to sign up to your materials, to your CSA. And then another one that we have is a guide to CSA retention. Uh, this is in our resource library and it's from Local Food Marketplace. It's a guide for keeping CSA members coming back, growing your value of your CSA to your customers and also deepening your community connection. So we encourage you to, to head over to the resource library and see what we've got there these two things, as well as many other resources that uh, might be valuable for you. Um, and finally, I would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, he'll be giving us an overview of research on CSA members. Uh, Dr. Galt is the W.K. Kellogg Endowed Chair in Sustainable Food Systems, also the Director of the Agricultural Sustainability Institute, and a professor in the Department of Human Ecology at UC Davis. Uh, and Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Holly, for that nice introduction. And I'm excited to be here. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I will, um, I'm gonna share my screen just to make it easy for me to click through. So I'll start doing that. Um, do it. Of course, now it's not showing up like it was before. Um, There it is. Okay. Sorry for that. I was ready before and now it has changed. So um is it working now? Can everyone see my screen? Okay, looks like it is. Okay, great. Well, thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you for the invitation, um, Holly and Sadie, to to talk about this. And when I said yes, it was a few months ago, and I thought, oh, I will just look at the um the literature that's existing on the 
changes in CSA preferences, uh, especially post pandemic, because that's, I think, what's on a lot of people's minds is what's happened since the beginning of uh, lockdown. Um, but unfortunately, there was very, very little on that. <laughs> so I don't have a lot on that other than uh, I've been part of a, a group that's been looking at that in terms of direct marketing. Uh, but we don't have our data all analyzed yet, and it's not quite done. But um, we can talk about that. And so what I'm going to do is talk about um, an overview of research on CSE members that I've been part of in California for the last five to 10 years. And that way, um, we can get a sense of some of the answers uh, to questions we've looked at. Uh, we were especially interested in comparing uh, current members with former members in terms of why they joined. Um, you know, what their experiences were like, why they left, those kind of things, and especially with an eye towards former members thinking about, you know, why are they leaving and, and what could be done to increase uh, retention. So those kind of questions are very much on my mind as well. Um, and so, you know, some of the, the things that are pretty obvious from looking at the literature is that the continuing members are more likely to perceive the changes that are required to be a CSA member as positive. And these are, you know, changes like uh, having to cook seasonally, right, with fresh produce that comes about um, through the the farming process, and you know, being directly um, the consumers of those things, you know, in real time as they are produced. And then the other bit that's pretty clear is continuing members experience many more benefits from participation than former members. So their perception of benefit from that membership is quite high relative to former members. And so that's just a you know overview. Most of us know this at this point. Um, the, the source down there is, is what I'm using for this talk in terms of the main publication that's informing this. We'll see some data coming out of that. Um, make sure I can, there we go. Um, in terms of looking at former members and the research on that, there's there's a little bit less, but one of them, uh, or quite a few studies show that they, they leave to... mainly due to dissatisfaction <laughs> with the share. So especially the variety of the share and or the ability to customize it in order to meet their needs. And so this question of, of you know how how can uh, a local farm kind of provision um, kind of regular consumers produce needs uh, in terms of variety in terms of you know customization these have been forefront in people's minds those doing CSA you know those doing the research for um, at least a decade or so now the the other bit of this um, looking at the the review of literature is former members report fewer reasons for joining. So in some ways you could think about it them as perhaps being less motivated or having fewer motivating factors of why they're joining. Um, and so we were interested in that as well. And so looked at that too. So it, most of the studies that I cited there, they were just, they were based on case studies looking at single um, single CSAs. And in many ways that, that's, that's super important, right? Because we get a sense of what it's like, you know, within those particular CSAs. But we were interested in, um, casting a much broader net than just one one study or two or one CSA or two. So we decided to really do a statewide study in California, and this was in the the mid 2010s if, uh, to to look at you know the whole population of members that we could get a hold of the poor, the whole population of former members and of CSAs. So we did it. Um, we did four surveys. One was of all CSAs in in the state at the time that we could find. Another was asking them to send it to their current members. Another was asking them to send it to their former members. And then we did a, a wide um, survey of grocery purchasers generally throughout the state using a, a fairly randomized sample. And I won't talk about that one here, but here we're going to talk about the, the former member data and the current member data and a little bit of the, the CSA farmer data as well. Um, so if we look at what happened out of that in the member survey for the current members, that's on the top there from 2014, 2015, we asked all CSAs in California that we were in touch with to send their links, our, our link to an online survey out to the members. So we had um, 1,149 responses from 41 different CSAs. So quite a few did send it out. It would have been great to have more, but that's, that's what we got. And it's a pretty good data source. And then the former member survey is the second main one on there. You can see that elicited 409 responses from former members and was sent out by 27 CSAs. The one thing we did with the data is we took out the former members who had uh, left for what we called you know, fully exogenous reasons, meaning that it wasn't part of the CSA relationship that they were dissatisfied with. That they moved out of the service area as, as the most common one of these. Um, and they didn't, so they didn't need their membership because uh, it was a, a problem or an issue. It's just they left. 
Um, so taking those out, we have 377 responses. So in, here we look at the, um, the difference in terms of, or the difference in similarities of reasons for joining. So the former members is the first column there. And this is out of 10, they were able to rank each one from, um, from zero to 10 in terms of importance of so 10 being the most important former members and current members on the, the other column to the right of that. So really there's only three main differences statistically. Um, they're pretty similar except for support alternative organic ag, the third one down. Actually, I can I can highlight these. Um, former members are less likely to value that in terms of a reason for joining. Um, for convenience, you can see that the former members are more likely to join for reasons of convenience. And then uh, to improve farm workers' working conditions, that is more likely to happen for current members. But everything else is basically the same. Um, so it's kind of interesting that, that they're both, there's quite similar in many ways, but uh, a little less um, interested in organic ag, a little less interested in farm worker, and we could probably say farmer um, well-being, and then more interested in convenience in terms of the, the former members. And one thing we did was we asked them for a variety of characteristics of CSAs, we asked them, how important is it to you on the one hand? And that's, that's the y-axis here. And then um, how satisfied are you with that thing with that particular characteristic of this of the csa that you're a member of um so this is for current members satisfaction is on the right and what we did is we took a, a we took the difference between those two so we're calling it important satisfaction analysis it, it's kind of a modified version of what uh someone developed in the business kind of school side of things in the 1970s um but you can see it for current members here if you look at the difference between how important it is subtract out how satisfied they were if you're at that kind of middle dotted line in the very middle of the graph going diagonally, that's exactly equal. So your satisfaction is equal to your how, how important it is. If you're below that line, uh, it means that the, the CSA is doing a better job than you basically expect in some ways. That So you're quite satisfied. So for current members, um, the there's a general very high level of satisfaction with almost everything in terms of... Uh, their satisfaction is is higher than how important it is to them. So that's a, a big finding on our part. Uh, the only, um, there's a few things kind of on the line that are marginal, but things like uh, appropriate diversity of products in the share and the farm's organic practi uh, practices um, are kind of near that line, but they're not crossing it over. So that's the, the current members on average. And then when we look at it for the former members, I have to go back, here we go. Uh, the former members, uh, you see a lot more crossing that diagonal line in the middle, the kind of the, the the darker, kind of bigger diagonal line. So there's more things up above that, which means that the uh, satisfaction is lower than how important it is to them. And so the the ones the ones that the is the worst, if you will, is the least satisfying to them, vis-a-vis um, -vis how important it is. Is the appropriate diversity of products in the share that darker blue dot up there? Um, but there's a few others that cross that that con region one concentrate here, and that's for the for the the CSA to concentrate on, right? If we were to try to retain members, these are things to do. Uh, diversity of share would be something to tackle. The lighter blue one, appropriate quantity of food in the share is there, and then ability to choose share items is that orange one. So in some ways, those are the least uh, the ones that they're least satisfied vis-a-vis -vis the how important it is to them. Uh, affordability is up there as well, but it's a little bit lower. So hopefully that's making sense in terms of how to read those kind of graphics. There's things that they're very satisfied with here uh, relative to how important it is. You can see them down here in terms of former members, former members overall. Um, so th these are some big differences that, that inform uh, why former members become former members. And so we, we did, um, don't need to worry about the details of this, but as a logistic regression where we looked at um, the reasons, um, or what, what kind of characteristics that, or experiences that members had that had the strongest relationship to them leaving. So why is it that they're most likely to leave, um, satisfaction with appropriate diversity of products in the share, as you just saw up there is, is one of the most important ones. Um, satisfaction with convenience, pickup and delivery location is another really big one in terms of influence. You could see um, transportation interfered with CSA participation that caused people to be more likely to leave. The three pluses just mean that's the statistical significance. It's very strongly related to leaving. So if they're dissatisfied um, with the share, if they're dissatisfied with the convenience of the location, they're more likely to leave. And um, 
also, if we go on from the inter the transportation, the third one down, the importance of ability to choose share items. So the more they thought, the more they were interested in choosing share items, the more likely it is that they were to leave the CSA. Um, and then and satisfaction with ease of communication with this, the farmer was um, also impacted if they're dissatisfied with that. So another way of looking at this, then we looked at um, just a, a particular question we asked, why is it that you left? And we had all these reasons uh, and we also had other as well. And we looked at the percentage that strongly agreed or disagreed. And you can see that on the far right side. Um, so number one reason based on just the, the answers that we had given them in terms of this closed ended question was the the main reason for discontinuing membership the product mix did not meet my needs so very close to half of the former members said that um if you go down a little bit the next one lack of choice is 41.5 percent and then too little diversity of in products in the share is 34.6 and we, we the next one lack of time for cooking or processing food and inconvenient to pick up or receive the share those two we considered uh, mostly exogenous meaning that the csa cannot um address that very easily directly in some way, right? Unless you start to cook for people or, you know, process food. And that's a whole, you know, whole other kind of realm of, of uh, um, kind of retail, if you will, in terms of going into that. Um, and then an inconvenience for picking up, sure, that could be kind of dealt with, but it's also an issue of people having time. Um, the, the ones that, that kind of come down a little bit lower, like F your lack of choice about quantity and or frequency is about, you know, 25% almost. Uh, price per box is too high and it's 19. So that it's actually fairly low. And I, I know going into the research, some uh, uh, CSA farmers that I know were concerned that their prices were too high, for example. And that's not a huge motivating factor for, for a lot of the folks who are leaving. It's about 20% agree to that. Too much food in the shares and is very similar to that. If we walk down from there, um, lack of knowledge of food preparation is also slightly or mostly exogenous in terms of you know, CSAs can help with that and shared resource networks like um, CSA Innovation can help with that too, but not 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 entirely. You can't necessarily overcome that directly. Um, too low value is there as well at 17.6%. Too little food in the shares, 10%. Uh, so you see that it's more likely that people are going to be dissatisfied with too much food than too little um, overall, at least. Payment period is too long is actually fairly small as well. And that was something that CSA uh, farmers I talked with were interested is like, if I shorten my pay period, are people going to be more likely to stay? And at least according to this data, it's not that important. Um, and then CSA op started operation. That was a fairly minor percentage. Um, in terms of what we were able to do with the data as well is we had uh, two CSAs who offered customization at the time to, they answered the um, farm survey and they also sent it out to their members. And then one of those sent out to former members as well. And so we realized we had a little bit of data about share customization and what that meant vis-a-vis -vis, uh, consumer satisfaction or member satisfaction. So we, we got a sense then of saying, well, what if we take the data and we look at the satisfaction of those who are doing customizable CSAs, the members of those and former members of those versus, versus just kind of the standard uh, non-choice, if you will, kind of CSA. Um, so the data we used was this current members, 118 members from the two customizable CSAs, and then 65 in the second bullet there from uh, former members of one customizable CSA. And it, this, you know, this should be taken with a grain of salt in the sense that it's a fairly small data set and it doesn't um, encompass a lot of the different types of customization that would be important to check out. But it is it is a little bit of data here, and so the what, one thing we were concerned about is well, we said, well, is it from this one that that we have the former member data from? How is it doing relative to other CSAs? So we looked at its retention rate uh, compared to the average, and it had a slightly higher one. So I think it was about sixty six percent annual retention, and the average in our sample for CSAs was about sixty two percent. So it had so that, so in general, then it was doing fairly well, if not slightly better than uh, CSAs on average. So it's not like this was a, a CSA where it was kind of problematic in terms of a former member, like there were a ton of ton of turnover because former members were dissatisfied for necessarily other reasons. So so anyway, we, we looked at this and we, we said, well, 
um, when we compare the data, there's no significant differences in satisfaction with the ability to choose to share items or content between former members of standard CSAs and former members of customizable CSAs. Uh, so in, in other words, um, the former members of both types of CSAs are the same in how dissatisfied they were with the ability to, to choose to share. So having some choice didn't impact um, those former members who left anyway. So that was kind of bad news on our, for our part, um, at least thinking that customization might be one way forward. Uh, but again, this is a fairly small data set. Um, the thinking about customization retention, right? all the literature and, and most of our studies as well have shown that share customization really does seem likely to help retain more former members so, since their major complaints are typically around the, the share in some sort of way and, and choice. Um, but when we look at also a, kind of another data source here, looking at our farm level data from 80 different CSAs, um, the share customization really has no correlation with retention rate. So if we look at just, just you know, at the raw data, as to say of these 80, 13 are customizable, their retention rates are the same as everyone else who's not doing customization. Um, and so that's 16% that's of those. So those 16% of CSAs are doing share customization have no difference in retention rates from the standard CSAs. And then we did a regression model to, to kind of control for other variables as well. And we within that, we also saw that share customization was really not a significant independent variable to explain retention rates. So that was surprising to us because we thought uh, farms that had moved towards customization were actually more likely to be uh, retaining members um, better than farms that were doing kind of standard boxes because of all, you know, all this literature on why former members leave. Um, and so we call it the CSA customization paradox based on our data. Uh, so we really we see that former members leave because the product mix is not meeting their needs, uh, either due to lack of variety or unfamiliar produce or um, other reasons. And then we say that being able to customize their share really seems to be a, a really good response. Um, but it doesn't really pan out from the farm level data, at least here in California. So we have this no association between retention rates and customization. So this leads to a bunch of other questions for us, certainly in terms of what, you know, are there different kinds of CSA retention or CSA customization that could work better than other kinds, these kind of questions. Uh, and we'll definitely need more data to answer that. And so to get a leading to the, those hypotheses as to why this might be occurring, um, I think one is a pretty solid one, um, solid hypothesis. Former members mentioned lack of choice about CSA shares and as reasons for leaving, but they actually want choice for non-seasonal produce. So they, they're not going to be satisfied kind of eating within the seasons, if you will. And therefore, you know, having a grocery store style experience with being able to choose is probably what they're looking for. Uh, they might want bananas, they might want avocados, depending, you know, uh, those imported produce that that really some people consume quite a bit of. Um, number two, as a hypothesis, some ways of offering share customization increase retention rates while others decrease them. So that was one thing I mentioned just before, is that there could be this intervening variable that we're not looking at, which is what kind of customization is leading to changes. There might be some that are actually leading to better retention, some leading to worse. And then number three here, um, is this uh, kind of tyranny of choice idea. That is, there might be gains in membership that occur through share customization in terms of you might be pleasing some of the former members who then become current members and stay or stay as current members, but you might be losing some people who don't want choice at all. Uh, so, so some of the CSA members certainly don't want <laughs> to be bothered by choice and that's how they've been members for a while. So is it that you're kind of offsetting and it's kind of a zero sum game in terms of you customize and therefore, you know, more former members who would be former members in a standard chair or stay around and fewer of your current members who don't want choice, right? They kind of leave. So we don't know, right? That's kind of the, the bottom line. We don't know why this is occurring, but these are some of our ideas that, that we came up with as to why this might be the case. Um, and so it led us to basically theorize about CSA people and, and grocery store people. So the, the interesting thing about being a CSA member, right, is you have to like, or at least you know, tolerate uh, being subjected to a number of conditions that aren't necessarily easy. So uh, depending, you know, based on kind of US culture, if you will. So one is eating what's seasonally available, two, lack of choice in weekly produce selection. And this can lead to pretty big economic risk, especially if you're lower income, meaning that if the choice, if that selection doesn't meet your needs, 
you're going to need to supplement and that's going to be extra income coming out of um, your produce bill, if you will, or your produce budget um, that you weren't necessarily planning on. Number three, cooking with whole ingredients. Uh, another thing that that is not super common today. Um, number four, having to retrieve your produce from additional place. And so in thinking about transportation burdens, right? Um, in addition to, you know, some people do one-stop shopping and they're adding anything else to that, it becomes a pretty, pretty large inconvenience or difficult thing to do for the household. Uh, and then the last one, number five, uh, paying in advance for produce requires reserves of money. And as, as we see, uh, not a lot of the um, households in the United States have a, a ton of cash sitting around ready to kind of pay uh, for a larger share uh, or, or for like a you know, quarter share, if you will quarter of the year. Um, so that becomes a, a challenge. So there's, there's all these um, kind of challenges. They, they, I'm not saying these are insurmountable. It's just that, that uh, these need to be dealt with by households often at the household level, unless there's something else that's helping them to kind of deal with these things, which sometimes there are, and that's, that could be very helpful. Um, but this is in contrast to supermarket people. And so most people in the U.S. are supermarket people because each of those five it goes against strongly held norms and prevailing social trends and you know, structures, social structures that have shaped them. So one, the year round availability of produce, especially through, you know, uh, shipping at long distances has meant that, uh, you know, for since the eighties, at least a lot of consumers have gotten very used to being able to find most of their produce on a, on a weekly basis, despite its inability to be produced locally in that time. I mean, in that um, for them within that space, um, consumerism, especially this kind of ideology of more choice leading to more satisfaction. And so being subjected to, um, a farm's, you know, decision-making process and therefore, and, and, you know, the whims of, of, um, agriculture, uh, and, and everything that goes into it, right. Um, means that, you know, you don't get that same choice that you might or might not, you might not want an eggplant, for example, that weekend, you're going to get it. Uh, number three, trends towards eating away from home. This is a big one uh, in the last many decades. Um, and eating more processed food, people are eating out more. They're eating more processed food. They, um, uh, that means that, that in some ways there's de-skilling around cooking too. And number four, there is decline in the amount of hours allocated to housework. And so housework, uh, you know, amount of housework done by households has gone down quite a bit in the last many decades. And so it's another kind of thing impacting this is you need to allocate uh, switch household labor from some other task or, or leisure, you know, into a new uh, form of um, processing whole foods in some kind of way. And then lastly, most households don't have these large sums of money to prepay. And, you know, there's, there's various ways to mitigate that, as we've seen in terms of uh, SNAP uh, being able to be used increasingly in various places, for example, so that it doesn't have to be large chunks of money and also, you know, benefits coming from um, supplementary income sources, for example, can help pay. So, None of these are insurmountable. It's just, it, it goes against kind of these cultural trends, if you will. Um, and so in addition to that, what we have seen through our work is this uh, kind of set of our, what, what we're calling resiliency factors for CSA people. And these are things that allow them to persist as CSA members in spite of problems or difficulties that they might face, right? And so one of those is really valuing this production consumption sim system that simplifies choices instead of seeing it as taking away their agency or their power to choose. So a lot of things have really shown that uh, satisfied members tend to um, experience this lack of choice positively instead of as a burden. And so in some ways you can think about this, right, as, as uh, a simplification of the, just the amount of mental work needed to plan out menus. If you say, this is, this, these are the parameters, they're set by this box and I'm gonna kind of think creatively around those. If, if that's a fun task, then that is one of those resiliency factors. Um, Another one is understanding the difficulties of farming and the way mainstream markets hide farmers and farm workers' struggles. And so if, if they're really uh, understanding of how agriculture works and, and how difficult it is, right, to, to be a farmer and to produce on a regular basis, right, uh, it's just a, if they understand that, I think that's, that's been shown to be a resiliency factor as well. And then lastly, and this isn't comprehensive, but this is what we've been seeing. Uh, valuing other CSA aspects, including say, benefits to farmers, uh, farm workers, environment, and personally experiencing these collective benefits as positive, right? So having a more collective style of uh, value system where you see other people's well-being and other, uh, you know, environments well-being as part of your well-being as well. So this kind of being in common with uh, others is also very helpful. So, um, what, what often interferes with participation is um, 
or, or, or if there is interference with participation, you know, external shocks to the household in terms of income, you know, job loss, um, losing members, adding members of the household, all these things can make think life really challenging. Um, so the stronger the resiliency factors are, the, the more likely it is they're going to be re remain members. And so one of the studies I haven't talked about much here, but or at all actually until just now, is that we compared lower income households and, and higher income households as members. And one thing we found was that the lower income households are really highly committed CSA members. And so they're in many ways, they're more committed than the, the higher income households in terms of willingness to pay for the share. And we asked a kind of a, a willingness to pay question where they're saying, how much is the share worth? How much would you be willing to pay? Uh, and then also very, very valuing the various attributes of CSA. So really being these committed members. And, and, and in a way, this makes complete sense according to this theorization, because um, committed CSA people, uh, low income uh, households have to be more committed CSA people in many ways, because the economic conditions that they're facing are much more likely to interfere with CSA participation in various ways. So that that kind of having those resiliency factors makes a difference um, for, for the folks who are of lower income households. And so to uh, kind of wrap this up and make sure that we leave time for questions, we our data is suggesting really the customization paradox uh, is really um, the, the suggestion from from us is that there's no single kind of optimal structure of CSA shares that's going to please the current and former members, and and so that that is, could be really positive or it could be really negative depending on your perspective on that, right? In some ways, there's no wrong way to do it. Um, there, it, it's hard to say whether you know with more data, if we could say um, with different styles of customization, different types of customization, do those impact retention rates? And, you know, if we hold kind of uh, location and geography steady as well, do we see within certain regions that certain forms of customization are leading to better uh, retention outcomes, for example, that'd be something to to be able to look at. We don't have that data now, and that's going to be hard to get, but we we have some ways of, of getting there, perhaps, and we can talk about that. Um, we other conclusion from this study, the customization paradox really needs to be further explored. Is it appearing in other regions and other kinds of uh, CSAs? To what extent does it apply elsewhere where customization is occurring? Um, and then I see kind of three ways forward for CSAs, right? One is try to meet some members' demands for choice in some way. Um, and actually, one thing we're doing here at UC Davis, the, the, under ASI, the, is the student farm, which has a 60 to 70 member CSA. And the um, the lead market gardener there, she really wanted to try out a, a version of our CSA where it's, um, on Thursdays, it's kind of pre-packed, if you will, as normal standard share. And then on Mondays, she started a farm stand version where they can come in. You can, it's kind of nice because it's a social event too. You can say hi to, to the farm uh, the people who are working on the farm there and you pick up the the parts of your share that are part of it i'll tell you kind of on the whiteboard which ones to get and then you can uh swap there's kind of a swap box as well and so if there's certain things that you don't want you can swap them out for other things um and i i we have i have pending uh, work to do in terms of looking at that vis-a-vis -vis the standard share and, and what that's doing for people so that's a, a kind of an experiment that we're running here um, no data, just just to put it out there. And then another way forward is to seek out CSA people more to say where where can we find a group of members who we haven't necessarily found yet, right? To to enjoy the CSA experience uh, with us. And the last one is is perhaps challenging, but also where we could go in terms of uh, cultivating CSA people, meaning that trying to um, uh, change you know, our ways of being in terms of identities and our individuality and our collectivities and these kind of things. It's an interesting um, way forward in terms of who who might do that work, but that's something to be discussed as well. And the other piece that we concluded on for the study was really that um, growing inequality means that more of the population faces increased structural impediments to CSA participation that we identified above. And so having um, more people, you know, in the lower tier of income means that there's fewer mem possible members of CSA because the, um, the the incomes tend to skew quite high in terms of CSA members, at least here in California. And so as you approach the lower income um, households, they're, they're much, much less likely to be CSA members for a variety of very good reasons. So that was the, uh, the few end conclusion points to, to end on there. Um, 
I want to open up for questions and I will stop sharing my screen so we can do um, better views of each other. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, that's fantastic work. And I'm, sh I'm sure there, there's already been a number of questions in the chat box. Um, we'll awesome. try, and we, we actually asked people to submit questions prior to coming here. Um, so if you have questions, if you haven't already put them in the chat box, please do that. Um, I wanted to just start with one thing. I think one of the <laughs> main themes that I saw coming through in the questions that were submitted beforehand, it had a lot to do with COVID and the impact of COVID. I mean, it's the elephant in the room on things like customization, trends in consumer preferences and things of that nature. And, and I know we talked before and you said you, you know, you were looking to see what kind of research has been done and there's, well, not, there's, there's research being done, but maybe it's not yet out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to uh, visit, um, Elizabeth Henderson had a question here and maybe it's more of a speculative question maybe. And it's, uh, if you were to do, I'm kind of paraphrasing what she had written, like COVID has revealed all these um, crises, these concurrent crises of racism, climate change, uh, rise of fascism, possible nuclear nuclear war. Like it's, we're in a very kind of unsettled time and COVID really opened up a lot of this. Um, so if you were to do this research again, um, looking at maybe values of what, you know, what people would say uh, is important uh, to them in signing up for a CSA or at least, you know, wh why they left, what kind of maybe additional questions would be involved um, now that we've had this experience of COVID and, and everything else. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that, Ryan, or and others you might have some too? Yeah, I, I, I have to think quickly on those, but it's certainly a um, great question, Elizabeth. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of uh, kind of both. I guess what I'm, yeah. There's a lot there um, to try to bite off in terms of. I think I'm trying to think of kind of CSA vis-a-vis -vis, you know all of these particular things. I think that the question of of uh, kind of racial inequality and racial equity in the U.S. in relationship to CSA is a really really interesting one. And something that we've been trying to do work on for a little while now. I haven't published much on that yet, but uh, it shows up a little bit in um, the the high income, lower income um, comparisons there. But I think that 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 was really interesting work in the sense that what we were able to show there was that um, there is racial disproportionality in CSA. We, that's obvious to most of us in the U.S. Um, but what happens is that's also strongly uh, intersectional with income, and so as income goes up, what we see is that disproportionately goes down until the very high income brackets where it doesn't exist anymore. And so, so you, it is kind of this combined race class um, issue that CSA is facing both kind of a whiteness issue, but also a, a class issue where uh, people who have lower incomes are just mostly not participating in CSA for a variety of reasons. And because as we know, you know, uh, racial inequality means that folks of color are typically on the lower income spectrum. Uh, that means that there is this also kind of white disproportionality going on in membership. And it, it could also be because of the cultural norms and, and kind of cultural coding of the of CSA spaces as well. And that's that's a, a, a whole other kind of thing to look at as well, is to say, how do we have um, multiracial, multi-ethnic, uh, kind of inclusive uh, food systems that are doing work for everyone? And that's certainly a big question and issue here in, in California that um, the student farm here at Davis has been trying to, to tackle uh, directly. So that's that's got the only one piece there, a rise of fascism. I mean, the, this is, yeah, there's, there's a lot there in terms of the uh, the question of, of rural, the rural United States and, and where it leans politically and what that can mean for our future and how, but for me, the, the bigger question is how do we, um, Kind of create common ground between people who see themselves as quite different and disparate because at least in my my view of the world is most of us share a huge amount of values that are actually quite similar uh, but at least in the u.s political system we tend to be divided and pulled apart based on divisions that are actually about issues that um are not uniting us right and so so that i think this it, it, csa could be very interesting in how it could bridge um different worldviews, different political um, ideologies, certainly, because 
that's actually one of the great things about local food, I think, is that it can it pulls on a variety of kind of strings in both conservative and liberal, progressive, libertarian ways of being and ways of thought that can kind of bring those together in some sort of way. Um, so I think that that's kind of interesting just to, to put it out there. Um, and I, uh, so ready of climate change, I, I guess, yeah, that, um, I mean, I don't want to belabor the points, but I think these are really good questions, Elizabeth. And I think, um, you know, this question of, of how do we adapt to, and then also strongly mitigate climate changes is, is super vital to what we're doing in ag. And I would say CSAs, you know, most of them are, doing a great job vis-a-vis -vis climate change, at least the ones that we see in California in terms of carbon sequestration in the soil is very, very high, most likely uh, moving towards alternative forms of energy, very high. I'm guessing electric tractor adoption is gonna be high as things come on board. These kind of things that a lot of CSA farmers are at the forefront of is super important. It's uh, you know, getting the rest of the, the ag sector on board for a lot of this is gonna be more challenging, I think. Um, Nuclear war. I don't. I'm. I'm not going to go there right now. So I'm just going to leave that. If that makes sense. Uh, but I would love to to talk more and hear other thoughts and questions. So, Jerry, what, I, what I'm really oh. suggesting, Ryan, is that we're at a different place mm. where standard marketing questions maybe are very interesting to explore but where CSA has an opportunity as an organizing um, approach to solidarity economics that opens up a whole new um, range of possibilities for different involvement, um, different kinds of support for the farmers, different levels of participation from members who feel that their lives are in this unsettled time and they need to really um, make some kind of commitment if they want to survive and build a healthy world. Mm. Right, great point. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really great point, Elizabeth. In terms of, I've I've always felt like CSA could be on the the vanguard of big social changes, right? That allow us to be more in common with each other, right? Instead of being so individualistic, and it feels like. That's I, I completely agree, and I, that's the the kind of one thing I put in there in terms of cultivating CSA people, right? How do we how do we change our ways of being, right, in relationship to each other to do those kind of things? And I think that's that's certainly there. One there, that really, there are some CSAs that are doing some things that are really far out mm. with great success, and some of them in very conservative areas. Mm. In um, Temple Wilton, is in as conservative a uh, part of the country as as there is, but for all the years of their existence, they provide the members with the budget and members pledge what they can afford to pay, disregarding how much they act, food they actually take. So cutting the connection between pounds and dollars paid. So as a community, maybe we need to look at some of these outliers that are really successful Mm. in this, you know, different communities and draw from them ideas that may actually help CSAs um, make a much bigger contribution than, than just um, providing middle-class people with more local food. That sounds great. Elizabeth, if you have a list of those to look at, I would love to see that. I mean, I know you do in your mind, but if you're willing to share those, I think having having kind of cases of of the more cutting edge and and more far out there, as you're saying, you know, examples to say like what happens if you try to do these kind of things instead of the the more kind of traditional marketing approach. A group of Dutch um, CSA farmers were really tired of and about to give up, really because they just couldn't afford to live on what they were being paid. So it occurred to them to say to their members, how much do you earn an hour? Mm -hmm. Maybe you would like to pay me that amount per hour of the time I put into the CSA. And it turned out their members actually valued it to that extent. And the farmers doubled their revenues, mm. enabling them to continue farming. If they hadn't asked the question, no one would have, you know, come up with that answer. 
Yeah, I love it. So Ryan, one of the um, one of the questions, and since you brought up like rural rurality, and that was a, a topic here for a second, did you, when you did this research, did you find um, differences between whether the uh, the shareholder was in a rural area or an urban area in terms of values? You know, the, what we've been talking about sort of gets at, I think, you know, the idea of CSA people, and maybe there are different types of CSA people depending on where you are. I didn't know if you had looked into that at all. That was a question someone submitted earlier. Yeah, it, just really briefly, we did look at it in the, the California context to say uh, we, we partitioned the state into four different regions. So there's uh, kind of we had Southern California, we had the Central Coast, uh, which is you know, urban and rural. We had the Central Valley, which is kind of similar. And then we had the um, kind of far northern rural, kind of I was going to rural remote California, where we have it's about 2% of the population, but it's almost you know, 30% of the state. Um, and what we did see was we did see a difference in values uh, in terms of reasons for joining, uh, kind of food related values in between those different regions. That's the way we did that analysis. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember all the details at this point, but generally, one thing that was very interesting was it rural, kind of rural, remote California valued local food quite a bit more than Southern California. Um, whereas in Cal Southern California, the, they were more likely to value organics. Um, so that was kind of one of the bigger differences. And so I think that's, I mean, that's true to the, the, the rural roots of CSA in the U.S. as well. Um, if we look at the, the first farms, they, they were rural. And uh, the first, very first one by Robin Van Inn was, was very remote. And that was one of the reasons it was quite successful is because she was doing things in terms of doing uh, production there that was not available, uh, you know, in those local kind of rural regions. So we do we do see a difference in values as well, and I don't know if that plays out throughout you know the U.S. Of course, but you know, valuing the local food is uh, it might be more higher in rural areas, depending. I don't know. It'll be interesting. To look at. Are there some other questions we have uh, for Ryan that people felt were interesting in the chat, or that you could bring up just with your own voice? Opening up. <clears throat> Because I, I mean, I still have the list that you sent before. I got a few more questions, but um, yes, live. Feel free to ask live questions. Are okay. there any overall trends in? What we're seeing as far as CSA, it, it seems like three to five years ago, uh, maybe even seven years ago, we seem to have peaked in the CSA movement where people were really, it was kind of a new trend and people were really on it. Are, are, is there any uh, data out there showing what the trends are overall for people migrating or migrating away from CSA? That's a great question. I'm, I, I was looking for that data before I gave my presentation and I couldn't find anything for the last few years that have been published so far. But I know Jerry is, is part of a, a group that's been doing some of that work. And so I'm going to defer to him on that. Sure. Uh, I mean, the probably the best source of that was the uh, Local Food Marketing Practices Survey released. The results have been recently released by the USDA. And they it's not so much of a trend as it is just total sales. Um, we've been, as part of the CSA Innovation Network, we've been trying to collect data from the, the areas of the country that we have representation from. And I mean, anecdotally, we have seen COVID really had opened up a sort of burst of new interest and in activity in CSA and CSA farm expansion. We saw that in a lot of places around the country, but we don't have, yeah, nobody, I don't think there's anyone out there that has a full picture of what CSA is doing around the country. And we, we really want to know what's going on this year because we have heard some stories that maybe people have um, gone back to more convenient options for food acquisition now that COVID has, well, it's not gone away, but we've decided to sort of collectively ignore it. Um, so that, yeah, I don't know. There's an, that, this, is, um, this is actually, I'm going to make a pitch here. If anybody is interested in these kind of questions, we are, um, the CSA Innovation Network is putting together a working group to talk about data um, and metrics issues related to things, things like that and figuring out what kind of questions are the most important to be asking and measuring and things like that. So if you have any interest in that, please contact me or anyone else in the Innovation Network. Um, 
Okay. Any any other questions we have here? Feel free to go live. Hi, um, my name is Linnea. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, it sounds like when you were making this distinction between CSA people and supermarket people, uh, grocery store people, that really identity might be a, uh, quite a driving factor in deciding to sign up for a CSA and also retention. Um, I was wondering if you have any ideas to share about how to marketing and direct your marketing towards um, identity. Hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't have any solid answers on that. I do know in, in California, there's a few CSAs around racial and ethnic identity that have been quite successful. And so um, like there's a Asian, um, Asian American Pacific Islander kind of focused one I, I remember hearing about. And then also African-American kind of focused CSAs in the East Bay have been successful from what I've heard and seen. So, so that's just on the, the racial and ethnic identities. Um, in terms of other, other kind of lines of identity, I'm not sure um, if there's other examples that people have out there, but I could, I can imagine, you know, being a um, kind of a queer friendly space, for example, and saying like, we, you know, we're going to try to go for that side of things and that, that side of identity might be really helpful too. I'm not sure if, if anyone started to do that. So um, yeah, I don't know about other ones. I mean, um, there, there's some that do try to reach out to lower income households, certainly through, you know, getting SNAP participation and saying, you know, we, we value our, our members who have SNAP, et cetera. And so those are, those have been ways to, that's less identity and more kind of economic circumstance, if you will. Um, but yeah, I, so I don't, not much of an answer, uh, but that's what I have, I guess. Any other thoughts? I'm happy to hear from other folks too. I think a fascinating story that perhaps people in this network could really um, enjoy hearing is that of Shinji Hashimoto, who is a KK farmer in Japan, who was on the verge of giving up CSA because he'd had two total inundations of his farm with mud from mudslides and terrible weather. And with even worse weather, he announced that he was going to stop farming. And the area, the Kobe area, um, food co-op members said, no, no, we will help you. We really need you to provide food for us right here. And we're going to do whatever it takes to be supportive. So he now has more members than he ever did before and, and several other farms that he's associated with. I, I think that Elizabeth, that, that um, kind of communication between uh, farmers who have been doing this for a while and then members and their broader community can be super important in order to share those lived realities. And I think this is one of our cultural barriers to, to CSA in the US is we have a very strong, um, um, I would call it a taboo against discussing our own you know, economic well-being. Uh, and, and so that a lot of farmers, I don't think feel comfortable or safe sharing their economic struggles, even with their CSA membership, even though that's one of the founding kind of principles of CSA from the beginning was to say that the economic well-being of the farmer is paramount. And we should probably expand it to say the, the overall well-being, right? Not just the, the economic well-being of the farmer is super important. And so, you know, the, so being able to share that in a comfortable way with members or potential members is, is really important. It's kind of getting over that, that cultural taboo around discussing income and and economic circumstances of families and households and, and entities like farms. Um, so that's the kind of one piece. And the other one is, is really in terms of cultivating CSA people and people who might be interested in, in you know, saving a farm like um, that one that, that Elizabeth just talked about is having more 
I mean, it sounds obvious, but having more people who are agriculturally literate, right, around the, the challenges and difficulties of farming and the 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 huge kind of problems and and difficulties with the um, the the current food system, right? So, kind of more education we have on the critical side of those things of kind of the challenges and difficulties of the food system as it's set up, and then the the you know the the how it is to be a farmer and why it's so difficult those, I think that helps to cultivate the CSA people, certainly. And that's, it's one thing I'm trying to do, you know, in my professor role here in terms of teaching. Um, but it, it's something that, that, um, you know, could take a broader movement to do as well. I've got, we got time for one more question. And there was, uh, I'm going to uh, refer to something in the chat here. And there are a few questions also in the intake survey about just the practical implications of this kind of research. So, um, the question was from Future Harvest, and it was, how can farmers react to this kind of data in real time? Um, it can be challenging, uh, especially with the nature of academic research. So are there ways that we might be able to share strategies in a peer-to-peer -peer way to reach new customers and serve existing customers better? That was kind of the, the verbiage there. So do you have any thoughts on that? That's that's a great question. <laughs> um, I mean, I, ideally, you know, as as my work progresses, I would love to see it become more informed by the CSA world, right? To say, okay, these are these are the questions I had. They were informed by my local circumstances and the CSA farmers I had on my advisory board for doing this research. But if we're going to do this broader and respond in real time, then that's a that's it it means that we have to be more coordinated, right? In some way, both as researchers and as a, um, NGOs and everyone else doing this work and farmers to say, like, how do we come together to answer questions more in real time that are pressing and, and real for farmers? And then how do we create relevant data coming out of that data collection? So it's it, it's very much in line with, with particip participatory action research, which is a, a great way of doing research. Um, and I'm fully game for being part of those kind of conversations and things into the future. So I, I would count me in. I, I won't be driving it, but I, you know, I can, I can help in, in the ways that my identities and roles can influence or be helpful there. Um, so I would be, I would be game for, for thinking about kind of what's our collective kind of interests and needs and wants around data and analysis and, and what, how might we go about doing that together? So I think that'd be fantastic. That's great, thank you. Um, Holly, I'm gonna turn it over to you to finish this thank out. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Jaris and Ryan and everyone for uh, such a fascinating conversation. Um, just a few things to wrap up before we head out. Um, hang on. So first of all, thank you uh, very much for attending. We will be sharing the slides in a follow-up email and also you will see our recording uh, posted on the CSA YouTube channel. So go on, head over there. Uh, we have another CSA lab coming, coming up in October. This is gonna focus on farm labor. Uh, it's October 11th and we'll have speakers from Fair Share CSA Coalition and NOFA and Urgency, which is the international CSA coalition. Uh, Elizabeth Henderson, who joined us today, will be a part of that conversation. So if you'd like to hear more of her um, brilliant ideas, please join us there. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure to have you online today and thanks to our speakers. And we hope to see you in, uh, in October. And please take a second to fill out an evaluation. There's a link in the chat. Uh, we really do look at this data and uh, we really appreciate all of your, your input. Registration for the lab will be open soon. So head on over to the CSA Innovation Network website. You can register for the classes and you can see our resource library and all of what we do. Thanks everyone and I uh, hope to see you in October. Thanks everyone, take care.